We will begin this morning with our friends Terence Hegarty and Mary Pratt, who come from not far away right now, uh, down the street in Holliston. And Mary Pratt and Terence Hegarty are sharing uh, this morning's feature together. Mary is a folk acoustic singer-songwriter. Uh, she began early at age five, uh, singing Eddie Fisher's song at a neighborhood talent show. <laughs> She's been singing her heart and soul out beautifully ever since. She has a, a few CDs out there. Uh, she performs solo. She writes her own songs. And she also uh, sings with Terence Hegarty. And uh, Terence had noted uh, when asked about their performing together, what happens in uh, performing music as a duo. He said, in performance, supporting Mary, I consciously step back psychologically, and instead the two of us protect our individual artist selves, and that is what makes our sharing feel so good. Mm. And Terence uh, grew up a little um, down the road in uh, Dublin, Ireland. He was the <laughs> youngest of seven uh, there, and uh, he said he developed a voracious appetite for poetry and fiction and began writing poetry as a child and songs as a teen. He was in a marginal rock band in his teens, or in the 70s, and then he um, said that in his family years, uh, he was uh, involved in um, in corporate related work and he would go up and write and sing and record late at night in his attic. And in, he has been, uh, he has a number of uh, wonderful CDs out there now sing, performing as a solo singer songwriter. And uh, in, uh, in his recent years in Boston, he's been known as Great Eminence of Folk Song Noir. <laughs> That's a mouthful. <laughs> And uh, when I asked Terence about one of uh, his most memorable moments sharing songs, it was with Mary um, in Dublin. And, and he said at the two Dublin open mic experiences and uh, for opening at Cobblestones there. And uh, that was with um, oh, Una Boyle. Yes. And uh, the other performer is... Uh, No, they're okay. <laughs> at the two Dublin open mic experiences with Una Boyle, uh, and they were openers at Cobblestones, and they were received with both reverence and enthusiasm. And the quality and variety of songs and singers was outstanding. And even though there was liquor flowing freely through all three rooms, they were totally committed to the singer and the songs. Mm -hmm. And I do understand how that can happen in listening to Terence and Mary. And we will see that now. Please give a warm welcome to Terence Hegarty and Mary Pratt. My young love said to me, my brother won't mind. And my parents won't slide you for your lack of kind then she stepped away from me and this she did say it will not be long long till our wedding day she stepped away from me she moved through the fair and fondly I watched her go here and go there then she went her way homeward with one star awake and the swan in the evening moves over The people were saying no to wherever where. But one had a sorrow that never was said. And I smiled as she passed with her goods and her gear. And of my dear I dreamt it last 
last night that my young love came in. So softly she entered, her feet made no din. She came be close side me, and this she did say. He This is, um, they have these things, am I all set here, um, called Irish pubs. They exist everywhere in the world except in Ireland. Um, Irish pubs are, are a different thing altogether. So anyway, I had a, I had a short gig once, for not very long, because I, I hated it, where I was playing in an Irish pub in Washington, D.C. This was when I was about 23, 24. And um, of course, no one, it was just, I had constantly fighting against the noise, and they were shouting as much as they could so that I couldn't be heard. And um, so I got to just doing whatever I felt like, you know. I was much more brazen and much more egotistical in those days than I am now. I just didn't care. So I took to writing, doing things that they kind of made no sense. And I, what I tried to do was write songs that sounded vaguely Irish, because I thought maybe they'd notice that. But then I threw in things that were totally, you know, did totally off the wall. And this is one of those. It, 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 um, it capitalizes on the Irish uh, penchant for foreign place names. If you're familiar with Irish poetry, you'll know that they love words like Hamburg and Valparaiso and things like that. They're always sticking them in the middle of Andes, you know, in the middle of all this Irish, you suddenly hear Baltimore or something like that. <laughs> Well, I said I'd be home about a quarter past nine But you didn't come round cause you drank too much wine Well, I hope it was sweeter than you were to me Cause I'm leaving this country to sail on the sea From Baltimore Harbor, the ship as it's land Is sailing for Chile and then for Japan If you want, you can reach me in Valparaiso for the days they grow longer, I've got to go. Well, I saw you on Moore Street with Freddy the head, and it poisoned my evening. I squirmed in my bed, and it's night after night now. I'm stretched on the rack, and it's all you can give me is a stab in the back from Baltimore Harbor. The ship as its land is sailing for Chile and then for Japan. If you want, you can reach me in Valparaiso. For the days they grow longer and I've got to go. You know, I wouldn't do it, what you'd done to me. We discussed this before over muffins and tea, and you ought to remember we reached a rapport whereby each had a license, but who knows what for? From Baltimore Harbor, the ship as its land is sailing for Chile and then for Japan. If you want, you can reach me in Valparaiso, for the days they grow longer and I've got to go. We have a very small selection from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wonderful medieval and 17th century uh, poems in them reading Thomas Kinsella's translations. And we're just, we're just going to do six of them, alternate back and forth here. And Mary's going to start with um, uh, Leodon's, uh, I don't know what to call it, lament for her treatment of her. her. It is miserable what I have done. I have tortured the thing I loved. It was foolish not to let him have his way, but for fear of the king of heaven. He thought it no harm, love he longed for, <coughs> reaching paradise with no pain. It was a little thing turned Curther against me. I who showed him such tenderness. I am Leodon, 
I love to cure her. It is true what they say. A little while I was with Kurher. He thought well of my company. Forest music sang to me with Kurher and the sound of the blazing sea. I thought I could never have angered Kurher, however I managed my love. I cannot hide it. He was my heart's love, no matter how much I might love others. A roar of flame has torn my heart. I know it will not last without him. I don't know who it is that Aiton is going to sleep with, but I know the lovely Aiton will not be sleeping alone. <laughs> Black of brow, with cheeks aglow, blue of eye with hair so smooth, wind rowing through your parted locks, fine women at the fair are watching, wives pretending not to look, plait their hair in front of you, with fingers through your lovely hair, one of them is studying you. Through, through her lovely hair. <laughs> Take my song of love to heart, lady of the lying love. You and I from this time on must endure each other's loss. If you hear them talk of me in the cottages or the big house, don't discuss me like the rest. Don't blame me or defend me. In the chapel, in the abbey, in the churchyard, or the open air. If we too should chance to meet, don't look, and I won't look at you. You and I, we mustn't tell my family our Christian name. Don't pretend, and I won't. I ever looked at you before. <laughs> <laughs> if you come at all, come only at night. Walk quietly. Don't frighten me. You'll find the key under the doorstep and me by myself. Don't frighten me. There's no pot in the way, no stool or can or rope of straw, nothing at all. The dog is quiet and won't say a word. It's no shame to him. I've trained him well. <laughs> My mammy's asleep, and my daddy is coaxing her, kissing her mouth and kissing her mouth. Isn't she lucky? Have pity on me, lying here by myself in the feather bed. <laughs> it is far from just between us, myself and my beloved. Myself all eagerness, and she without much interest. That she'd leave me there for money is only the way of a woman. While I wouldn't desert my love if she came to me in a shirt. <laughs> she carries the load lightly, the love that lies heavy on me, nor suffers from my sickness. It is far from just between us. Mary is going to read now some of her favorite Patrick Kavanaugh poems. You wanted to do a lot more, but I think there's only going to be two but they're lovely things. Yes, I, I became acquainted with Patrick Kavanaugh when I was, uh, I had the great fortune of being able to go to Ireland uh, uh, all over the country uh, at this point. We did have a tour of the West Coast, but uh, Dublin quite a few times because of this uh, lovely man who just performed for you, Terence. And um, along, uh, there are canals on either side of the city, Dublin, in the south. It's the Grand Canal, um, which is uh, to the waterway. Boats go up and down and so on. And um, uh, Patrick Kavanaugh, there's, a, uh, there's a, a bench, a park bench, as you would find in any park right along the canal at one point. And um, there's a full-size, life-size statue of Patrick Kavanaugh sitting on the bench like this. And you cannot 
resist sitting down next to him and having a chat. It's amazing. Um, and this is how I first came to be acquainted with Patrick Kavanaugh, personal relationship with him. Okay. Um, I'm going to read two of his poems. His poems are marvelous. The first is Bluebells for Love. There will be bluebells growing under the big trees, and you will be there, and I will be there in May. And for some other reason, we will both have to delay the evening in Dunshachlan to please some imagined relation. So both of us came to walk through that plantation. We will be interested in the grass, in an old bucket hoop, in the ivy that weaves green incongruity among dead leaves. We will, we'll, we will put on surprise at carts that pass, only sometimes looking sideways at the bluebells in the plantation, and never frighten them with too wild exclamation. We will be wise. We will not let them guess that we are watching them, or they will pose. A mere facade like boys, caught out in virtu virtue's naturalness. We will not impose on the bluebells in that plantation. Too much of our desires adulation. We will have other loves, or so they'll think. The primroses, or the ferns, or the briars, or even the rusty paling wires, or the violets on the sunless sorrel bank. Only as an aside, the bluebells in the plantation will mean a thing to our dark contemplation. We'll know little by little, glance by glance. Ah, the clay under these roots is so brown. We'll steal from heaven while God is in the town. I caught an angel smiling in a chance look through the tree trunks of the plantation as you and I walked slowly to the station. And the second is called Memory of My Father. Every old man I see reminds me of my father when he had fallen in love with death one time, when sheaves were gathered. That man I saw in Gardner Street stumble on the curb was one. He stared at me, half-eyed. I might have been his son. And I remembered the musician faltering over his fiddle in Bayswater, London. He, too, set me the riddle. Every old man I see in October-colored weather seems to say to me, I was once your father. The other big Irish subject is, of course, emigration, which has been the curse. Is this microphone positioned properly? Okay. Uh, it should have been the great curse of Ireland for 300 years now. It started out as a um, kind of an upper class. Uh, the, 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 the people who were in power in Ireland, who owned the land, who, who basically uh, were the local powers, were all dispossessed by a series of English uh, invasions and plantations. And some of them fought back and some of them left. But anyway, they were all done away with one way or another, and their land was all confiscated. And, um, they were, they had connections in Catholic Europe, which was generally opposed to Protestant England at that time. So most of them went and uh, became involved with foreign governments. And that's, we have like Napoleon's General McMahon and Bernardo O'Higgins, the liberator of Chile and, uh, and, uh, other, and Hennessy's cognac, those kinds of things. But later on, because the people they left behind no longer were part of a community that centered around the, uh, the domain and were just basically left to fend for themselves in the, in the standard capitalist fashion. Um, they just went far more and more and more downhill and had, and had to leave in droves, especially after four million of them, um, were, or many millions of them, were destroyed in the, uh, in the Great Potato Famine, which 
So anyway, this is, I was myself at one point an emigrant, and um, I suppose there's something personal in this, but basically I just wanted to capture what it feels like, or what it must have felt like, what it must feel like. Is that you climbing up the gangway? With your papers in your hand Now look at you after all these years In this enervating land Remember mama on the dark side with the baby in her arms The tide rolls and the boat does rock She signals her alarm And there's nothing but the promise gleaming from your open eyes the fear down underneath does not show through Oh, you might want to try your fortune on a basket full of lies If that's the case, I do not envy you A million strands across the ocean The voices of the sea Seems like every place I try to go There's always you and me Always you and me I'm going to read a letter from an American woman in Japan who was writing uh, to her friends and family here in the States after the earthquake and tsunami. A letter from Sendai. Things here in Sendai have been rather surreal, but I am very blessed to have wonderful friends who are helping me a lot. Since my shack is even more worthy of that name, I am now staying at a friend's home. We share supplies like water, food, and a kerosene heater. We sleep lined up in one room, eat by candlelight, share stories. It is warm, friendly, and beautiful. During the day, we help each other clean up the mess in our homes. People sit in their cars, looking at news on their navigation screens, or line up to get drinking water when a source is open. If someone has water running in their home, they put out a sign so people can come to fill up their jugs and buckets. It's utterly amazing that where I am, there has been no looting, no pushing in lines. People leave their front door open as it is safer when an earthquake strikes. People keep saying, oh, this is how it used to be in the old days when everyone helped one another. Quakes keep coming. Last night, they struck about every 15 minutes. Sirens are constant and helicopters pass overhead often. We got water for a few hours in our homes last night and now it is for half a day. Electricity came on this afternoon. Gas has not yet come on, but all of this is by area. Some people have these things, others do not. No one has washed for several days. We feel grubby, but there are so much more important concerns than that for us now. I love this peeling away of non-essentials, living fully on the level of instinct, of intuition, of caring, of what is needed for survival, not just of me, but of the entire group. There are strange parallel universes happening. House is a mess in some places, yet then a house with futons or laundry drying out in the sun. People lining up for water and food, and yet a few people out walking their dogs. 
all happening at the same time. Other unexpected touches of beauty are first. The silence at night, no cars, no one out on the streets, and the heavens at night are scattered with stars. I usually can see about two, but now the whole sky is filled. The mountains of Sendai are solid, and with the crisp air, we can see them silhouetted against the sky magnificently. And the Japanese themselves are so wonderful. I come back to my shack to check on it each day, now to send this email since the electricity is on, and I find food and water left in my entranceway. I have no idea from whom, but it is there. Old men in green hats go from door to door, checking to see if everyone is okay. People talk to complete strangers, asking if they need help. I see no signs of fear. Resignation, yes, but fear or panic, no. They tell us we can expect aftershocks and even other major quakes for another month or more. And we are getting constant tremors, rolls, shaking, rumbling. I am blessed in that I live in a part of Sendai that is a bit elevated, a bit more solid than other parts. So far, this area is better off than others. Last night, my friend's husband came in from the country, bringing food and water, blessed again. Somehow, at this time, I realized from direct experience that there is indeed an enormous cosmic evolutionary step that is occurring all over the world right at this moment. And somehow, as I experience the events happening now in Japan, I can feel my heart opening very wide. My brother asked me if I felt so small because of all that is happening. I don't. Rather, I feel as part of something happening that much larger than myself. This wave of birthing worldwide is hard and yet magnificent. Thank you again for your care and love of me. With love and return to all of you, Anne. Thank you.